If you don't know how Sev wounds are calculated, or you don't know the three good uses that endgame players have for tier one units, then this is the video for you because I'm going to go over 14 tips that you probably didn't know in Rise of Kingdoms. And let's make a deal. If you learn at least one thing in this video, go ahead and drop a thumbs up on it. Or if you're feeling generous, go ahead and do it anyway. But first, what's going on, guys? Cheers. Rocking the Omniarch mug today for the green tea. Okay, tip number one is going to help you increase the march speed of your units. And this is especially important if one of your armies is out of position during open field fights and you have to quickly retreat them back to safety well I'm going to show you guys how to do it just a little bit faster and okay it's too hot for the cardigan the trick actually has to do with the status of the territory that you're marching to so for example you see here that I have my Minamoto with my Tsao Tsao this dark green territory is my current alliance and if I go ahead and send my Minamoto over here we can see that his march is two minutes and 43 seconds and if I put him exactly back where he started and then we send him him to the light green territory we'll see that it's three minutes and 23 seconds so a significant increase in the march speed time and we can do this experiment a little bit faster by sending him here and we could see 247 and then we can send him here and it is 319. so what exactly is going on here and how does this help you retreat from unfavorable fights even faster well as i mentioned before it has to do with the status of the territory that your army is going to not the status of the territory that your army is currently on and that is very important so in the example that I just gave here the light green territory is actually from our 90 L which is in our coalition but is not my alliance and what you noticed is that even if I send an army to the coalition territory it's going to get there much slower than if I were to send it to the adjacent alliance territory it's significantly faster to march on to your own alliance territory so what does this mean well if I want to go far across the map like let's say I want to go over here would it be better for me to send my army here and march for three minutes and 38 seconds or to send him here in March for two minutes and 57 seconds obviously you know the answer but the reason that this makes a lot of sense for open field fighting is because if you're in dot mode okay let's pretend that my Minamoto is fighting an enemy right over here okay let's just say he's in combat and all of a sudden I notice that my Minamoto is overextended he's not in good territory so I want him to retreat okay I can click back this way for him to retreat or I can click over here on my Alliance territory and he's going to retreat even faster. You can literally see the dot moves faster when he's going towards Alliance ter territory than if he's walking towards non-Alliance territory. It's a little bit hard to see at least I'm going to be honest with you. It's a little hard to see visually, but as you saw before, your March speed is increased if your destination is Alliance territory. So even if you don't actually plan on going back to Alliance territory, it's still worth clicking on the nearest Alliance territory if what you're trying to walk is in a straight line and there happens to be alliance territory there obviously don't go out of your way to click on some far away alliance territory that doesn't make any sense the fastest way from one point to another is a straight line obviously so if you can do a straight line by clicking on alliance territory it will be faster otherwise just click in a straight line backwards and so now you might be thinking okay well Omniarch why is this the case why do you march faster when you're targeting Alliance territory and not coalition territory and that's because the increase in March speed actually comes from Alliance technology you have the rapid March technology here that says increases troops March speed when marching to a target that is in Alliance territory so the reason that you don't get this bonus when marching on coalition territory is because it is literally conditional to an actual Alliance that you are in in it doesn't have to be an allies alliance or anything like that it is literally a perk exclusive to your own alliance and if you want that benefit from your coalition well you should probably join their alliance and fight with them instead if it makes sense to do so okay tip number two has to do with launching a rally and so this tip is mainly for either rally leads or also for people who are officers in your kingdom who are often coordinating which targets to rally and that has to do with the number of troops that you need to put into the rally as the captain so if I am going to be the rally leader of this barbarian fort right it could be uh, an enemy flag an enemy fortress an enemy pass it doesn't matter what we're rallying if I am the rally leader then how many troops should I put into that rally well really you know you could put as many as you want but let's say that you want to conserve the troops of the player who is leading the rally or let's say that one of your main rally leaders accidentally got zeroed during kvk and now they don't even have enough troops to fill a full single march which is very very sad well what you have to know about being the captain of a rally is that 
it literally does not matter how many troops the captain has in the rally as long as he has his commander's equipment and armaments there it will perform exactly the same so whether again if i have 238,000 troops in here or I have a single troop in here it literally does not matter what matters most is that the rally is full from people reinforcing it and that there is a constant stream of reinforcements to get that rally at maximum capacity and since the rally captain is the leader of that rally their single troop is never going to die as long as the rally is still healthy and being reinforced and if you were wondering this is not the case for a garrison okay garrison captains can die and this often is the case when you're defending a flag or a fort one of the reasons that people loved Zenobia so much is because she has such a massive healing factor here as well as a ton of really tanky stats and this would kind of keep refreshing her troops as the garrison leader so even if she got down to you know 400 troops remaining a lot of times she would keep just healing back a certain portion of those troops and a lot of times Zenobia would almost never die if you were putting her in like a pass or something like that which was really really nice but now that we have commanders like Gorgo and we're kind of moving away from the Zenobia garrison we're moving back towards garrisons that do have the possibility of actually dying and that kind of sucks and I feel like it's a little bit unfair it really depends on who you ask of course if you ask a rally leader they're gonna like the fact that they can never die of course but whether or not it's fair is not the point of this video the point is that garrison captains can die and you have to be careful about that but a rally leader needs to only put in a single troop tip number three is found over in the expedition and what's actually really interesting here is that if you go into one of these side missions the garrison specific side missions and you go ahead and challenge you can actually create a preset of 750,000 units. This is very, very helpful if you're trying to build a really large commander preset without wasting one of your troop expansions. So for example, let's say troop expansions only last four hours, right? And let's say you want to use all four hours of that time you don't want to waste even five minutes trying to figure out how you can set up your different your different presets here right well one thing that you can do is you can come in here and you can set your preset to 750,000 tier five units or you could do some combination of tier five and tier four it literally doesn't matter you can go ahead and do that and then boom I can click this and set the preset and now we have a 750,000 troop preset and if I go ahead and back out here and I go to send out that same army what you're going to notice here is that it is still set to 750,000 and of course my troop capacity isn't actually that large but if I click on it it will just load the maximum amount of troops that I possibly can of the same tier and type so because also 750,000 was tier five units here it just fills it with tier five up to the actual cap which is really really nice and then if I actually go in here and I use a let's say a 25 percent unit capacity bonus here okay I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, I'm gonna use one for the video okay I'm gonna literally waste one for you guys so go ahead and like the video if you if you appreciate that okay but now if I go ahead and click here you could see that it actually automatically loads as many as it possibly can and I can actually still fill out a little bit more here which is nice so by going in and setting your presets with the expedition defense side missions you can not only save yourself a little bit of time and you can kind of plan your armies beforehand like the night before a big pass opening or something like that and then also as your troop capacity fluctuates throughout kvk like let's say you you know you have crystal tech some of the crystal tech actually increases your troop capacity right we have what is it called arms as you move forward through your troop capacity and increase it over time those presets are still going to be much larger than your actual troop capacity will ever be so you won't have to go in and actually change them again and it's kind of annoying tip number four has to do with the commander view page and how you can get the most amount of stats possible from these different roles that you can assign to your commanders and the thing here is that this works for both your primary and your secondary commander so to illustrate my point let's go ahead and use my Liu Che with CPO as an example okay so let's go ahead and load in this commander combination and if we come down here we can actually tap on the buffs and we can see what their current buffs are so we have 207.7 for the attack and we have 76.3 percent for the infantry health so now what we can do is let's go ahead and put our CPO as the commander view that gives you plus one percent attack okay so let's come in here and we'll go ahead and we'll set one percent attack we'll go to my CPO and now we can go ahead and try to send out the exact same preset 
and what we'll see here is it changes to 208 okay great now if we set our Liu Che to get the plus one percent health we should see this go up to 77.3 and in fact if we go ahead and do that where is our Liu Che boom there he goes and then we come over here and what do you know we load in that preset and boom 77.3 so if you guys didn't know and this wasn't this is not explained in the rules here at all right this works for both the primary and secondary whereas things like your talents for example the talents on the secondary commander don't matter at all the equipment on the secondary commander don't matter at all the formation on the secondary commander don't matter at all but the commander view buffs do matter which is interesting so make sure you get the best use out of it tip number five has to do with the limitations on defending a structure and in particular this is most important for passes because pass rallies and garrisons tend to be some of the longest exchanges in rise of kingdoms because if a pass is controlled the attacking army can't actually push through that pass until they take it which means they can't control the field on the other side of the pass and likewise if the defenders can't control the field on the other side then basically both sides can freely reinforce either their rally or their pass and as long as the trades are good this can go on for literally hours like nine plus hours i've seen we at one point our alliance actually held the world record for longest garrison defense at that time i believe it was nine hours i'm pretty sure that record's been broken at least once at this point but one thing that you'll notice is that if you come in here there does not seem to be any mention of a limit for the number of armies that can be inside the pass but in fact there is actually a limit and that limit is 100 people you can only have 100 armies inside a pass at any given time it doesn't matter how many troops each of those armies have so for example you could have a hundred players send a tier one cavalry to this uh, to the pass and this would say 100 out of 3 million and then somebody else could try to send in their full army and it would say that the rally capacity is full they would not be able to get in even though there would be two million nine hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred empty capacity okay and that's something that you learn the hard way typically because one thing that will happen is if you are defending a pass for hours and hours and hours some people send in their troops and they log off or whatever and they just leave those dead armies in the pass and as you know the pass gets rallied over and over and over again those armies go from let's say it started at 200,000 and then after maybe the second rally it's down to like a thousand or something like that and it can go even lower than that right but typically because sev wounds are given and deads are given in a sort of proportion to how many troops each individual army has in that pass those really low remaining troops Group armies typically will stay there for almost ever right which is kind of crazy and they basically hog or clog up that pass with 23 troops or 700 troops or something like that which is insignificant and then somebody with an actual full army can't get in that pass so if you are a garrison leader or you're an alliance leader an r4 somebody should always be checking the total number of armies in a given pass and if you see somebody drop below like 10 percent of units remaining you should kick them out because they might be afk they might not be paying attention and there could be somebody who has a full army trying to get in and they can't because somebody left their 12,000 troops in the pass and that means that you're going to take worse trades if the pass isn't actually full and that's how sometimes passes end up going down now speaking of defending a pass let's move on to tip number six where we're going to talk about how sev wounds are actually calculated in rise of kingdoms now it's important to know that the actual battle formulas have never been officially revealed by the developers but through extensive testing we've seen players get really close to estimating certain aspects of the battle formula and one of those things is the way in which sev wounds are calculated and this information actually comes to me from the individual who has coded the rock battle simulator his name is speco and i've talked about the rock battle simulator a ton so shout out to him for this information but the formula that is closest to how it actually works in rise of kingdoms is an exponential growth formula based on each army's percent of the total damage done in any given turn if we take a look at the battle log you'll see that there is dead units sev wounds and slightly wounded units obviously because we're fighting in the open fields and my hospitals were fully cleared there's not going to be any deads that i take from fighting a level 46 barbarian but as the battle goes on based on the stats of both sides and lots of other factors the game will decide how much total damage was done 
in any given turn and whatever percentage of that damage was dealt by your army is compared to the percent damage done by the other army right and we're talking about percent of total damage done during that turn on both sides whichever side of that fight dealt more damage that turn that means the other side is going to take more sev wounds during that turn and if we go back to this exponential function here what we're going to find is that you know basically let's say both armies are dealing about the same amount of damage every single turn well that means that both sides are going to take basically the same amount of sev wounds every single turn however as you're dealing less and less percentage of the total damage for that given turn the amount of sev wounds that you take during that turn goes up exponentially okay and this is why you should always retreat your armies when you're below 50 percent and that's kind of just a rough estimate number but the 50 percent mark i mean the amount of damage that you're dealing is based on the number of units that you have in your army and the battle log literally tells you this because it's basically measuring the damage in units lost okay so another way to think about this is if the enemy has significantly more troops than you they're going to be dealing significantly more damage and their damage as a ratio in the entire turn is going to be so high that you're going to take way more sev wounds than they will for that turn and if you extrapolate that out every single turn you're taking way more sev wounds then that's how you end up with really bad reports so hopefully now that you know how sev wounds are roughly calculated you can understand why it's so important to retreat your armies under the 50 or 60 percent mark so that way you save yourself and you save that chance of you being hit really hard and also if you have like let's say 20 percent of troops remaining right and you walk past a garrison that has let's say a, a gorgo liu che garrison and you get hit by that garrison the full garrison's liu che aoe you could die immediately because there's so many more troops in that garrison and you're being hit with a massive skill damage that it just instantly deals an insane amount of damage to you and you could pop in one hit which is actually insane hopefully i explained that well enough I know that I'm not like a super math guy. So if you're still confused, maybe comment down below and I or somebody else can help explain it to you. But moving on to tip number seven, let's go over the three uses that I can think of that a end game T5 player might still have for tier one units. The first use is actually for grabbing runes. That's right. I actually have two presets here filled with just a single tier one unit and the primary commander here is a mobility tree commander and the secondary commander is also some sort of cavalry commander that gives you some amount of march speed right if you guys didn't know dragon lancer is actually pretty fast he gives you 10 percent march speed which is nice but if i send this single tier one horseman over here it's gonna march to this hypothetical rune in two minutes and 46 seconds but if i take an army with even just a single tier five units okay it's the same number of units here boom one tier five is three minutes and 42 seconds so as you can see tier one units actually march significantly faster than tier five units and you can actually see that by coming into your stable and if you tap on tier one their march speed is 100 plus whatever your city bonus is and the tier five is let's see 80 plus whatever your bonus is okay and the bonus scales off of the base number so that's why the bonus is lower for tier five so your tier five units whether it's cavalry whether it's archers whatever they're always significantly faster and this is i guess the developers were trying to kind of balance out the weaker players against the tier five players and making it so that way you know tier one players can run away faster and you know it is what it is but this is why you'll often see players grabbing runes with a single tier one unit the second benefit of using tier one units as an end game player is that you should always be gathering with tier one units and the reason for this is because there's literally only upside to using tier one units as we already talked about tier one are the fastest in the game so your tier one siege that's no exception here they're going to get to the nodes quicker which means you're going to get to start gathering quicker which is nice they're also significantly cheaper to train those tier one units are basically nothing to train and also when you consider how much of your power at end game comes from your actual troops in your city a lot of times leadership in your kingdom is not going to want you to have any tier four or tier five siege because it's just a waste of power it's fake power it is meaningless it doesn't matter because for example a tier five siege is worth 10 power and tier five infantry is worth 10 power right so no matter what the troop type is tier five are all tier five they're all worth 10 power each so if you have 200 000 tier five siege that's an absolute waste of power that's two million power 
worth of just siege it's not going to help you in the battle at all and if you're in the top ranks of your kingdom like let's say you're over 100 million power or if you're a smaller kingdom maybe it's it's less than that but a good chunk of your power that's being used to calculate matchmaking is is going to just be siege which isn't real power because it's not actually used for anything meaningful and finally if you're gathering with tier one siege and an enemy comes through the pass and kills your gatherers well great news they just killed tier one units which cost basically nothing to heal and if your hospital is full and your tier one siege die who cares it doesn't matter that's disposable that's garbage they cost nothing and finally the third use that an end game player has for training tier one units is that the mysterious merchant can sometimes come around when you collect your trained units now I can't really demonstrate this for at least another 12 minutes or whatever the case is but typically when the mysterious merchant is not in your city then there's a couple of ways to get her to appear first of all for sure she always comes uh, around reset and also if you complete a building a research or a training there is a chance that she could come around so it's not guaranteed but if you are a tier 5 player and you've maxed your buildings and you've maxed all your tech then there's only one way to kind of encourage her to show up and I also think she shows up randomly so you know keep that in mind but you can entice her to arrive by actually just collecting your tier one trained units and then she might show up and you can get some nice goodies there for free and I guess a little bit of a bonus is that it also still counts towards your daily objectives right like remember there's always a daily objective that says train 200 siege 200 infantry 200 archers 200 calves those are four different daily objectives you can complete them by just training tier one units as as well so that's why I'm always training tier one siege in batches of 200. okay moving on to tip number eight this is going to be a way that you can send your weak marches back to your city faster than just retreating so for example if we take a look at my Guan with my Sargon here if he's going to retreat back to my city manually we could see how long that's going to take we go ahead and hit retreat and we see that it takes a minute and 10 seconds okay but if I can kill my army then the sad faced gray army is actually going to head back to my city even faster so here I can use my Guan to attack this level 41 barbarian and then we can quickly see how fast he's going to go back 32 seconds so it's about twice as fast to go back to your city by killing off your army than it is to literally walk all the way back now of course the benefit that you have from walking back is that you can jump into the node and you can jump into the city jump into the city jump into the city and you can get back pretty quickly by doing it manually but let's say that you have an army that's like super uh, you know far away and let's say that it's you know its main purpose was to collect a rune or something like that and then all of a sudden well now you have to bring that army back because now you want to fight with five ar armies or something like that I mean there's plenty of reasons why you would want to quickly get your army back to your city well you can kill it off and it'll get there faster and if you want to save AP because I literally just wasted AP to do that just to show you guys okay you could fight Guardians for example a Guardian doesn't cost any AP to attack and if they kill you then you run back or you could just attack an enemy player like you could fight them to the death this is especially helpful when you're fighting at altars for example because you can only send one army in at a time and so if you're fighting at that altar and you retreat back it's going to take forever to bring your army back but if you fight until that army dies sure your trade ratio might not be great but you're going to be able to send your army back much faster which means you're going to send in your next army faster as well and keep in mind that you can send in your next army even if your sad faced army is still running through the altar okay so you can only have one alive march in an altar at a time and so the fastest way to just cycle through and constantly have a strong army in the altar is to have it sad face moving on to tip number nine this has to do with healing down your hospital fast and also free now unfortunately this used to be much more powerful a couple of years ago but the developers have gone in and basically nerfed this so that way you can't do it as effectively I don't think it was ever a massive deal but anyway the way that the help system actually works is that every time somebody clicks the help button the minimum that it will reduce the time remaining by is one minute and you can get 30 helps towards healing down your hospital so you would think that you would only get 30 minutes worth of healing reduction but in fact the together we rise alliance technology actually increases that by 120 seconds or two minutes so in reality the minimum that you would get from a single help is three minutes so three minutes times 30 helps is 90 minutes so that's an hour and a half so if you heal an hour and a half's worth of troops 
at a time in batches which is usually about 2500 maybe it's 2800 it depends on your civilization it depends on buffs on your city and all sorts of other things city skin things like that but it's usually between two and three thousand units right which is a very small amount of units that means you have to do this a hundred times to get like a full army's worth of troops healed instantly right and also you have to have people online clicking the help button but you won't have to use any speed ups at all you heal in batches of an hour and a half on the timer down here okay you just drag up the troops until it says an hour and a half you click heal you ask for help and once those helps all come in then you'll be able to collect your troops so if you're in like a coalition with a lot of different people online this will happen pretty quickly but eventually you're going to hit the cap and the cap is going to basically make it so that way uh, your alliance helps come in much much slower and you won't be able to do this anymore but it does help for a few thousand troops every single day and then the help limit is reset every 24 hours or i think at reset moving on to tip number 10 that is in the museum the way that the museum works is that anytime you unlock an exhibit it costs a certain amount of exhibit coins and you can see here that every time you unlock an exhibit the cost for the next exhibit will go up gradually so for me the next unlock is 380 but let's say that you're a newer player and you don't have enough coins to unlock an exhibit for somebody that you really really care about let's say alexander the great right well what you can do is you can actually come in and you can relock or salvage a museum exhibit that you had already unlocked in the past so if i move my head here you can see in the bottom left corner there's actually a button that says salvage and it will give you back a certain amount of exhibit coins now 70 is not that much but it could be the difference between unlocking your next exhibit and not now of course the downside here is that you are locking an exhibit so if i did that for my mulan for example then i wouldn't be able to use her relic anymore even though i've already bought it but again this could be a good strategy to use if you have unlocked exhibits accidentally for commanders that you thought were good and then you realize that they weren't so for example like Cao Cao or El Cid right like I'm I can't imagine a scenario in my mind where I would ever use El Cid in a PvP scenario I actually unlocked this when I expertised him just so that way I could be done with him but then they implemented the new relic system and it's double relics and all that stuff and I don't care but if I was only 70 coins away from my next exhibit unlock I would consider salvaging my El Cid relic because I'm never going to use it and then I could unlock one that I might actually use like I don't know Saladin right or maybe Tamiris right these are things they weren't even in the game when I unlocked my El Cid relic only ever do this for commanders you're never going to use again because otherwise you're just throwing coins in the garbage moving on to tip number 11 we have to talk about the skillful craftsman daily objective now this daily objective will give you 10 objective points that is 10 percent of your entire daily objective here is completed with a single task which is nice but also upgrading a building is usually very expensive it's time consuming right sometimes buildings take dozens of days to upgrade and so to get this it becomes very hard especially in the late game but you can actually complete it by building any decorative structure that you've never built before so they've actually changed this it used to be different it used to be the case that you could just like literally delete a road and then build it again and that would count towards your daily objective here unfortunately that is not the case because if I go ahead and do this boom you'll see that the skillful craftsman objective has not been completed and the reason for that is because if I delete that road again you'll see that it says stock one that means that when I removed it from my city didn't unbuild it it just removed it from being visible and so then I could put it back from my basically my inventory okay so in order to do this objective now you have to see the actual cost and you have to pay the cost for that decorative structure so if you know I still have I have 140 out of 380 of these roads built so I could still do this for like 240 more days right uh, I could build this structure and boom there we go skillful craftsman is complete and if I really wanted to I could go in and I can do this for like the different trees the bamboo the willow the sakura right there's also you know other things these cost gems so I wouldn't do it for the gems also you could build like the holiday limited time holiday event uh, items those also count towards this as well if it's the first time you've ever built one so I know this is a trick mainly for newer players but it can help you out a ton as you're progressing through the early game moving on to tip number 12 this has to do with temporary city skins that you've already unlocked 
the permanent version of. So here you could see I have three days worth of blooming court. This gives me archer health at the cost of infantry health. And if I come in here to my city hall decorations here, I can scroll down and you'll see that I already have the permanent version of blooming court. I can go ahead and apply that now. But if I come back into my inventory here, you'll see that if I then go ahead and use blooming court, the three day version, it just gives me gems in exchange. So if you have a three day temporary skin for a skin you already own, you'll get 50 gems. If you have a seven day skin for a permanent skin that you already own, I believe they give you a hundred or 200 gems. And then I believe if you have duplicates of the permanent city skin, you can use the additional permanent ones that you have to also get some amount of gems back. I don't know exactly how many gems you get for that, but if you guys have been just sitting on on these bonus tokens that you've never redeemed go ahead and do it literally free gems just sitting in your account that you didn't even know about tip number 13 is for the spenders and in particular people who are looking to get their hands on the most amount of VIP points as possible this is important especially in the early game but really getting to VIP 18 that's a really big bonus you have a bigger troop capacity which we've already talked about in this video helps you deal more damage every single turn so getting to VIP 18 is a very long journey and it takes a lot of purchasing power and being in a good alliance but if you want to know which bundle will get you the most amount of vip points per dollar spent it's actually none of the bundles that you see on the screen here and in fact it is the daily special offer because the daily special offer if you spend the 4.99 that is five dollars you get all three of these combined and if we scroll down here that means well here you'll get 75 of the five vip points which is 375 vip the middle bundle gives you 50 of the five vip points which is 250 vip and then for the one dollar bundle you get 125 vip points for a grand total of 750 vip points for five dollars spent but if you come in and look at the regular bundles here you're going to notice that all of the five dollar tier will always give you 500 plus 25 so 525 for every other $5 bundle in the entire game. Now, I don't remember exactly if this changes for like, let's say holiday bundles. I don't think that it does. I'm almost positive that every single $5 bundle in the game will give you 525 VIP points. You can see at least that's the case for the standard bundles here right now. So if what you care about most is VIP points and there's a commander that you care about for the daily special offer, then that is the most cost effective way to get VIP points every single day. And finally, moving on to tip number 14, I get this question a ton, especially during my live streams. And that is players asking me why I'm always training tier four units and never training tier five units. And there's a couple of different reasons for that but to keep it simple there is literally no downside to training tier four units so let me explain if i train 2000 tier four units you'll see that it costs 600,000 food and wood and 40,000 gold if i train at 200,000 tier five units you'll see it's 1.6 mil food and wood at 800,000 gold and if i upgrade a tier four to a tier five you literally just pay the difference also if you look at the time that it takes to do this it's one day and two and a half hours hours and this is one day and 15 and a half hours and if we take a look at the difference in time oh would you look at that it's 13 hours 13 minutes and 40 seconds so the amount of time that it takes to upgrade is literally the difference as well so it doesn't cost me more resources to upgrade later and it doesn't cost me more time to upgrade later but it is beneficial to upgrade your tier 4 to tier 5 for specific events so for example a lot of times there will be an event that comes around whether it's the power upgrade day or whether it's troop training day for mightiest governor or it's one of the other events that calculates how much power you're gaining for a certain amount of time it's actually more beneficial to upgrade tier four to tier five than it is to just straight train tier five units even though there's no difference in the total costs for resources and then there's no different to the total cost of time spent or speed ups spent and the reason for that is because these events typically will give you points based on the amount of power you're training and when you upgrade a tier four to tier five you go from four power to ten power for every single unit so you're actually gaining 
six power for every single unit that you upgrade but you'll notice here that a majority of the time spent is spent just training the tier four units and the difference from four to five is only 13 hours so 13 hours for a six power per unit bonus is really nice so this is good for your speed ups but beyond the advantage of just using less speed ups having tier four units and using them to fight in the open field is actually a really good way to save yourself a really expensive hospital bill okay if we take a look here and we compare the stats the total stats of a tier four infantry units just a generic tier four infantry versus a generic t5 infantry you could see that the tier five unit has 12 percent more total stats this is this is rounded okay it's actually like 11.9 but whatever it is a 60 percent bump in power it is also a 69 percent nice bump in total cost okay it went from 620 total resources to 2000 total resources remember that's for a single unit but it's also a 95 percent increase in gold cost okay a single tier four unit is 20 gold a single tier five unit is 400 gold it's 95 percent more gold guys it's it's also 65% more resources to heal and 93% more gold to heal. Okay. So for a 12% bonus in power, you're getting 65 to 95% higher costs to both train and heal. And you can see that right here in my hospital. This is what it costs to heal a tier five unit. And this is what it costs to heal a tier four unit. Look at the gold. It goes from eight to 116 that's a 90 oh my god so all that to say if i want to save resources for big power pushes for events it makes more sense to upgrade tier 4 to tier 5 and also even if i don't upgrade tier 4 to tier 5 it's still beneficial to have a bunch of tier 4 units in my city because i can use a mixed army with let's say 80 percent tier 5 20 percent tier 4 and that's going to sort of offset some of my hospital bill anyway guys this video was way longer than i thought it would be so if you found it useful or informative or you learned something go ahead and drop a thumbs up on it it really helps out the channel a ton it'll help get this video out into the youtube algorithm so other rise of kings players might see it and while you're down there consider commenting any tips that you think that i missed that other people should know and consider subscribing to the channel and clicking the bell to be notified the next time i upload a rise of kings video with that being said guys thank you so much for watching this has been omniarch i will talk to you guys again soon peace